Vegas Christian Church this morning. It's, uh, it's a little tough for me this morning. Uh, one of the hardest announcements I have to make, uh, but today will be my last message here at Vegas Christian Church. And I thank you for supporting me over the last 11 years. But the time has come for me to move forward with me and my family. So, and for Hagee's Christian Church to start another chapter. So while we gather ourselves, while I gather myself, let's, let's stand and sing.
And I started this last year, but at this particular time of year, we need to revisit why, we're, why we exist so we don't forget. We need to be reminded that we do need to love each other so we don't forget, so we don't die, so we don't lose focus. So we, this is one of the annual messages that if you're with us at Hayes Christian Church for any length of time, you're going to hear again this time next year. Because we do need reminded. We need to remind it why membership is important. Participation is important. We need reminded why we all need to do our part. We continue. This is part two of that series. And we continue with our main scripture, which comes out to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Do you see that statistic? 150,000 people are leaving the church each week. That to me is not making every effort. That to me is people leaving the church because of offense. The devil set a trap. The snare's been set. People's been caught in offense and crippled in it. And it's crippled the church and the devil's laughing about it. He, he would rather have double than that leave the church weekly. And he will not stop and rest until he offends you, until he causes disunity and causes you to leave the church because... The Bible says to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Verse 4. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Our efforts really boil down to Ephesians chapter 4.4. 4. Because this is all why we're here. Right here. There's one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope. Say one hope. One hope. When you were called. That one hope is where God met you in your, in your vehicle, your living room, at that tender Bible, at the hospital, wherever it was that you could tell me you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I don't know where that was. Rehab clinic. I don't know where it was for you. Where was it that you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? It was at that moment, it's that hope that you hold on to, and it's that hope you project out there to the lost sheep of Hayden, or Orangeville, Reesville, Morgantown, West Old, Fairmont, wherever your geographical living areas are. We hope that we go out and reach lost souls for Jesus Christ. That is our hope, is to fill the pews with people who need a physician. Yes, having, having a church filled with spiritual, healthy people is one thing, but it doesn't stop there. We need to fill the pews with people who need Jesus. So what is a church environment that everybody would love to worship in? Well, it's not a one size fits all. It's not a, it's not a church that, 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 that accommodates every thought and, and lifestyle. It's not that so much. But it is one that's filled with love, and it's one that has welcoming doors. And love will get you beyond a lot of things. By the matter of fact, the Bible says love will, call, uh, will cover a multitude of sins. We all have this awesome responsibility to carry our hope. The Bible says that you need to give an account or you need to answer the person that questions the hope that's within you. You say you're saved? Tell me about it. How do you know you're saved? Why are you so happy about Jesus? What makes Him so real to you? You need to have answers to those questions. And if you don't have answers to those questions, your light is dwindling. You're losing your hope. If you've lost that, 
that you're stagnant. You need to revive it. You need to do something about it. You need to be up at the altar. And you need to, to, to rehash it out with the Lord and stuff and get things ignited again. Because if you stop sharing that hope that's within you, the church will die. So Ephesians 4.4 4 talks about you were called to that one hope when you were called. And when you were called to that hope, you hope to be with Him in, in heaven. When Jesus comes to take us home, you hope to be in heaven. It's that hope we're out of faith we're grabbing a hold of. we got to learn to share that hope with other people. So how do we get to a place where we're going as one? You know, it's hard to uh, to see if we're going as one if all we're doing is just getting comfortable. And it can happen in every church if we're not careful. It's easy to see people coming into the church over time and all of a sudden we feel uh, less and less urgent to invite people because the views are filled. But I don't see nowhere in the scriptures where it says once the views are filled you can stop inviting don't see that. If we're just paid to focus on the numeric growth of the church, then we, we will lose our evangelistic outreach. We cannot sit back and assume that because people are coming, we are accomplishing our vision, encourage, embrace, equip, and engage. Oh, we must be going great. The church is full. Oh. Are we moving people from their pews to action? Are, we, are people growing in their relationship with the Lord? Are they joining a small group where they can ask real questions about real people and real relationships? Are they asking the questions that need to be asked? Because it's not like, it's not a proper service outline to, to, to raise your hand in the middle of a Sunday service and start asking a variety of questions. This is not that way. It's a message. It's a sermon that comes to you of what the Lord gives to the, to, to the preacher. So in small groups, you get to interact and, and, and stuff. You're not put on the spot. You, you, you get to socialize and bond and create. Even create some mentorship within the group, I've heard said. Some leadership within the group. Our vision requires, it requires more of us as we continue to move as one. And I think there's a there's four things that, that in order to move as one that will help us move as one. And the first thing is we know we are going as one when our focus is outward. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is communicating with His disciples and His church here and now that we must always be going. Jesus didn't park His very end in a synagogue somewhere and stay there. It was always going. Now, your life and your calling may not be to be a traveling evangelist, but nonetheless, your circles of influences demand you to be an evangelist. You can do the work of an evangelist. The Bible says do the work of an evangelist. You can do it in your workplace at the gas pump. At your uh, uh, bingo halls, at your at your uh, back to church Sundays, at your car shows, and uh, on at your small groups in your neighborhoods, you can do that. You can do it on Facebook and stuff. You can still be inviting. You can still be telling others about your hope. Matter of fact, that's the important story, the most important story you have. How did Jesus come into your life? That's the most important story you've got. Nothing else matters. Yeah, God saved your marriage, but He saved you first. It's the most important story you'll ever tell. Jesus told another great story of this great cast with those who attended. Missed the point altogether. We see this story in Luke chapter 15. And it's verses 1 through 7 where he, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes 
sinners and eats with them. Ooh. I would love someday for someone to come up to me in Hagen's community and say, and not know who I am, but tell me, do you know that church down here in Hagen's is full of sinners? <laughs> Praise God! <laughs> and I think tax collectors is another word for hypocrites. If you think about it. Why is it mentioned tax collectors and sinners? Because tax collectors were sinners too. I just say they enjoyed taking money and extorting money from people and more than what they should, and they held up the financial integrity of the town, the village, right? So if they if they couldn't be trusted, they were hypocrites. So in some ways, I think it mentions tax collectors separate from sinners is because I think it's not but hypocrites and sinners, right? So praise God that Hagen's is filled with hypocrites and sinners. As we read on, we think this is the goal. This man welcomed sinners and eats with them. You know, religious people were saying this, Pharisees and teachers of the law. Verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99, the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, when I look at this scripture, because we live in rural West Virginia, Hayden, and because we have farmers in attendance, and because we, they also do uh, cows, I often find myself chuckling a little bit because when I read that, I'm like, there's some farmers that rather not get that stubborn cow that left the farm for the tenth time. You know, they're always getting out and stuff like that. Right? So the risk here is this. This is not the interpretation. Listen to me. People often think this means, well, if a member leaves the church, we ought to go after them and get them and blah, 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 blah. That's not this scripture. This scripture is about the whole world being God's sheep. What they're meant to be. Like, even though I lived a, a sinful life all the way up until I was 21, didn't mean I was less of a, didn't mean I didn't belong to God. I'm still His child. No more than you can deny your child, even though they're living a rightless life uh, without your, you know, they're living life not like you raised them to live it. Blah, 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 blah. And don't, you're still blood. You're still, it's still your kid. You're still God's child, whether you are obedient to Him or not. Now, so you're all sheep. What the Bible says is when it's talking about the lost sheep, those who doesn't have Jesus Christ in their life. That's the lost sheep. Okay? We're all sheep. But then there's some that's lost their way. They're rightlessly living. They're, they're going down that road. Then we need to go get them. We need to go get them. This has nothing to do specifically with church membership. I was confronted with that one day years ago about, you know, this particular scripture being membership related. No, it's world related. It's sheep in general. It's those who go out. You see what it says here? The reason I know this is because there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. If you're in church, you're hearing messages, you're doing the Bible studies, you're joining small groups, you're belonging, that's great. I don't need to worry about you. I need to go get you lost. Okay? That doesn't mean I need to go out there and get the offended one. You need to draw a line. People leave for multiple reasons. Those 150,000 people, yeah, they leave each week, but for multiple reasons. And sometimes very devilish reasons. And for the wrong reasons. Okay? Sometimes Paul let people leave because they needed to learn their lesson. <laughs> He's saying, you know, there's value. You know, I have one key to my truck. One key. And uh, I need to get another key. 
when I lose my one key to the truck, it's what I mean when I say this. I think Jesus is saying the value of what is lost determines the intensity of the search. Christ, God knows that Christ died on his on the cross. Take, take care of it for, for you. And loved you. And because he values you that much, he wants his church to very intentionally go after the lost. Because they mean that much to Jesus, to God. That he would send his one and only son. Now, I would search diligently for my one key if I lost it. Because that truck is my means of transportation from point A to point B. I would search diligently, wouldn't I? Imagine the most important thing in your life. The truck's not the most important. But imagine the most important thing in your life and you lost it. Or other than people, the, the most important possession you have, you lost it. How diligently would you see? Some would say the wedding ring. If they lost the wedding ring because it cost so much and it meant so much involved in the search, you know, forever. How much more does God want His church searching for the lost sheep? If He valued Him so much that He put His one and only Son on the cross, the church should never, ever lose their love for the lost. Ever. It's a problem if we do. The second thing, the second way we know that we're going as one is when, number two, when everyone participates in moving. When everyone participates in moving. When everyone participates in moving. If I had building blocks, you know, Joe has Legos. He puts on, you know, how Legos are. They build things. They make movies about it. They make whole movies about it. And, and, and so you, you're building them, right? Imagine everybody's a bunch of Legos in here. Or a bunch of Christian Legos. Everybody, they come into the church. Let's just say we just all gather them up, and that's all we do. And we only had a limited amount of room in our play area, you know, the circle. But if we all bring them in, and we don't build to create more room, then we're, people will have to leave because there's no room. So addition without building can become subtraction. You start losing people because you're not making the right decisions to build. So what we do, you're a Lego, we come in. Our encourage, embrace, equip, and engage is meant to do this. To take you as a Lego as you come in, as you sit down, as you get to know us and become a member and, and get involved. We take you and we put you, we build you. This, and I, I say we, I say the scriptures, your experiences through small group, your attendance, your church activities. God, they, we, we put you, we part, you're part of the wall now. We're building, we're building a church. We're building a church out of these Legos. When we take you from the middle and we put you on the wall, it creates more room in the middle. You can't be a church secretary forever. You've got to step aside and allow someone else to do it. You can't be uh, a worship leader or forever. I can't be a pastor forever. Do you know at some point in time I'm going to have to step aside and let someone else lead? That's the way God's intended. And I'm okay with that because I believe it wholeheartedly. Maybe that person is you. Do you know the teachers will have to step aside and let someone else teach? One well, of the hardest things I ever had to do was leave storehouse of prayer as a youth pastor and the associate pastor because you always wonder about the health. But you know what? God was leading me forward. I couldn't worry about the past. So I had to move forward. And you do too. And wherever you're at, you've got to ask God, how long do you intend me to stay here? And if I care about the church, who else am I going to pass this off to? Number three, we go as one when we remove the barriers to reach more people. We, when we remove those barriers to reach more people, the red tape, 
the small fry stuff to reach more people, we will move as one. What do I mean by that? Well, me, Pastor Rick, and Elder Bob, and the deacons, we get together and say, you know what? We want to focus on small groups. Hagen's Christian Church can do the work of an evangelist in Hagen's community, but we need to reach souls for Christ, and we're not willing to stop in Hagen's community. We're willing to go further. How do we do that? We do that through small groups. So if you had a circle here, and this circle represented people who traveled to Hagen Christian Church within a 50, uh, 20 to 25 minute radius. Maybe just 15 to 20. All right, and Hagen's Church is right in the middle of it, and this is Hagen's community, and uh, it intersects with places like Reesville, Orangeville, and Evertsville. The circle is in here a little bit deeper, okay, because it's not far away. But then you got people like in Westover, Watertown, and Fairmont, a little bit farther away, but still connecting. What do we mean by still connecting? This is what we mean. That Pastor Rick and Elder Plum and Pastor Isaac and the deacons, we've determined to send out people to lead small groups and homes that will create relationship, that will, create, that will spread the good news. And when we started this thing, we said, it's not even important that they belong to Hagen's Christian Church. Even though that would be nice. It's not important that they will become members of Hagen's Christian Church. We will already saw it. Is that right? Because that's the point. Let's reach souls with the good news of the gospel. We're not worried about the numeric number of growth because God will take care of that if we are doing God's will. So then we go out and we touch the West over area, the Warwickton area. Well, you say, Pastor, uh, you know, there's churches over there. Yeah, but I, I don't attend that church. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know how they're doing it, why they're doing it. I'm not concerned about that church. I'm concerned about the church that God's given me. I'm not concerned about being like the church down the road. Okay? I am concerned with partnering with other churches to reach lost souls. But I am not worried about what they're doing. I'm worried about what God's called us to do, and that is have small groups. Small groups, we, we remove the barriers because royal churches have a tendency to be so inwardly thinking that they say church is just for me. It's just for me. And it's not true. It's for all of us. It's for everybody, everyone. So we go out there, we tear down the barrier that church is just for me, and we uh, we remove that barrier, and we go out and have small groups. Teaching one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord of all. That's what we're teaching in these small groups. So let's do whatever it takes to evangelize our state, our counties, our communities. It's really one church with multiple locations, if you think about it. It's Hagen's Church sending out representatives of the church on behalf of the gospel, creating uh, centers of relationships is what it is. Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 and 38. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, he turned around to the believers, like I'm talking to you. He turned around to you. And this is what he says to them, to you. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, you can project on me all my responsibilities because I know you know what it's like to be a pastor because you've been one. Listen to me. This is not a scripture specific for pastors. This is a scripture for the whole church. That we are all to be prayer, praying for laborers. Not just a pastor. I know the needs of Hagen's Christian Church. They're made clear to me every week. If I could snap my fingers and fix every need, I would. But I think God causes us to go through storms to build perseverance. That until we learn as a church how to struggle, we're 
We're not going to learn how to be joyful in success. We're not going to learn how to appreciate things. So yeah, there is some struggle along the way. Yeah, we're always asking for volunteers. And yeah, we're lacking in some areas. But you know what? At the end of it all, I, I look back and say, you know, I'm glad I went through that because it's taught me so much. But I want you to know, workers, it, you know, we, we have to reach more people. We, everybody has to be on the move uh, if we're going to move as well. Because listen, the pastor doesn't do it all. And when this became a reality for me, it was a few years ago, when I started looking at pastors specifically. And what I mean, what I mean by that is a traumatic event happened in Morgantown, West Virginia a few years ago when a pastor drove to Morgantown, West Virginia, not far from University Town Center, had an encounter with state troopers. When the pastor had done some heinous things prior to to his family. And he drove from the southern part of West Virginia to the northern part to Morgantown in his van. And he got out and tried to get the troopers to shoot him. Until finally he gets back in the van, puts the gun to his head, and shoots himself. And it was only learned after that incident that the pastor not only experienced overload and, and nervous breakdown, uh, relationship breaks down and stuff, that there were some spiritual matters, some strongholds there, some pornography issues. Listen, 58% of pastors statistically are addicted to pornography. That's the statistic, believe it or not. I put it in God's hands. But this is why I can believe that statistic. Why? Pastors always call out to do hospital visits. The home visits. The pastor brings the message. The pastor does the special prayers. The pastor leads in the things of the food. The pastor does everything. Why? Because that's what it was like back then. Because we never motivated our people to move together. And we never told our people that they had the potential to lead and to pray. We, we can pray. You can pray. Do you know you can give thanks over the food at church? I'm not, I'm not, the, we're not going into the holies of holies here where, where unless the pastor does it, everybody dies. This is giving thanks over food. Quit asking the pastor to do it. Ask someone else. Matter of fact, how about you do it? How about you do it? <laughs> yes, you. And if it's three words you say, then so be it. If it's a hundred words you say, so be it. If it's 200 words you say, then we don't need to hear from you. <laughs> Listen, it's not, it's not the heart. Pastors are overloaded. They have to prepare messages every week. And you don't want Saturday night specials. You don't want TV dinners, do you? You want a home-cooked meal, something that took some time and some thought, right? So how about let's leave the pastors alone and give them time to pray and to bring a seasoned, modern-day, in-your-face message that can really minister to your needs instead of spreading them so thin, we'll just keep them wanting enough and we'll keep them coming back so we, you know, we'll keep them poor. So he's doing all these other things. He has no time for his wife. There's no time for his family. Guess what happened? The wife grows up lonely. The children grow up without fatherhood. They go off to live right as their lives. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the saying is true that the pastor's kids are the one. Because they're unfathered. They're ungodly. Because the pastor's off doing all the other God for all the other families. And that's, I truly believe, is why we get ourselves in the boat that we get ourselves in. And that's why you hear horrible stories like that about pastors. And I'm telling you, do a Google search on pastors, you'll find plenty of articles where they're morally, ethically, and spiritually failed. They're churches. They've let boundaries go down. They've allowed Satan to come in, temptations to crop up. 58% of pastors are addicted to pornography. 100% of that 58% occurs 
when the pastor is sent off and is in some other town on training in a conference because no one knows him there. They can't get caught that way. Per se. It doesn't take away the spiritual problem, though. It's still there. The last thing we do, if we're to go as one, uh, if we're to move together and stuff, we, we, we move as one when we are willing to see opportunity. 90%, the statistics say that 90% of churches are either dying or not growing at all. 90% of churches are either dying or not growing at all. It's because the people of the church are losing their passion for the lost. It's because the people of the church are creating a schedule that church is on the back burner instead of the front burner. Church is the last thing to get talked about at the dinner table and not the first thing anymore. Giving thanks is even put off because we're too busy in our phones. We need to make church a priority. I don't call you up and make fun of you for being church givers. I do that because it makes me laugh. And it, it, I pick on you, okay? The, more, the, the biggest reason I do that is I need you to stay hungry. I need you to stay uh, uh, intentional with your church attendance. I don't care about the offering. I don't care about uh, uh, numbers. I care about are you growing for the Lord? Are you getting are you getting uh, pricked in the heart by the Holy Spirit to draw closer to Him? Is that happening? Are we lifting up our hands in freedom? Are we breaking chains? Are we uprooting bondage in our lives? Are we being freed up? That's what we need to be asking ourselves. The pastor can pre preach the right message every Sunday. But if you stay up late on Saturday and give God your leftovers on Sunday morning, I don't know what you expect. You gotta be searching too. People are giving, you gotta be searching. In closing, we have three ways you can say yes. We're in our opportune time to do this. We started it last year, we're going to this year and stuff. We're, we're, we're talking about the church membership and why we need to love our church. And why we need to be a part of a church, a local church and stuff. We're talking about that this season of time. Because you are important. You cause us to move. I can preach to myself all day long. But we need your help to minister to the community. We need your help to, to encourage, to embrace, to equip and engage this community all around us. We need your help in Evansville, Arnsville, Reesville, West Oak, Morgantown, Fairmont, beyond. There's 80,000 people between Long County and Marion County that do not go to church every week. That's 80,000 reasons why we should not be sitting in the pews all the time. You can say yes by becoming a member and, and really committing to the vision, encourage, embrace, equip, and engage. Understanding what that is, what it means, and how you can help us move people from point A to, to point B. How, how do we move people? How do we make disciples? How do we continue to baptize and see people saved? You can say yes to volunteering in a gap. Maybe we got we always got gaps. We always got needs. I want you fed too, don't get me wrong. I you need to be fed. But you can't be consumers only. You can't be just a vacuum of the Word. You've got to expel the Word. You've got to, it comes in, it does its job, you, you got to let it out to people. you got to share it. It's not meant to be a treasure to be hid. You can say yes. You might, you might have said yes in the past. You can say yes again. Maybe last year was tough for you as a member of ACC. Maybe you had some ups and downs. You can say yes again. Say in your heart, if, if you're already a member of Hagerstown Church, you don't, you don't have to be signed up. But if you're not a member of Hagerstown Church and you want to sign up, I'm telling you, you can't. Go out there and get a next steps book. Go out there and grab a black folder on top of that. Take it home with you. Read it all you want. Me and Joey work hard on that. Look at it all you want. 
It explains everything. You got questions? Call me, email me, whatever you want. It's totally available to you. So if you're already a member, you don't have to sign back up. But I do want your heart to say, I will commit again and with passion and intentionality. I will join the vision. I will talk against the vision. I will join the vision. And I'll move the church forward. Let's go get souls. Let's do this. So that's that's what it's all about. In Ephesians one, Paul speaks to what we're doing as a church. He spoke it to Ephesus, the church in Ephesus. He says, "I keep on asking God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that He may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know Him better." I want you to know God better, guys. In verse eighteen, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He's called you. The riches of his glory, glorious inheritance in his holy people. If you call him Lord and Savior, you have an inheritance. And that inheritance is in heaven. You're not going to get it right now. It's in heaven. We have an opportunity tonight to join together with a grieving friend at 6 o'clock here at the church with dinner following. I urge you to come out and support this dream of family as we move forward as a church family. Please come out and do that because that's why belonging to a church matters. Because we get to come around families at times like this and do the very best that we can with what we have. So we have 100 members of the church and only 20 come out at the time. It's not a good show. I say if we have 100, we should have 100 tonight. That's your challenge. I don't know your schedule. But I know I can clear mine for tonight. And I know it's like to be busy. Let's stay together. Let's pray in our hearts. What, we, what, what, do, what does Isaac need to do to, make, to help Hagen's Christian Church further the vision? To accomplish the vision. What does Isaac need to do? I need to get more of my time, my resources. How can I help? We need greeters. We need youth workers. We need servers. We need land uh, property keepers. You know, people that will care about God's property as much as they care about their own. We need those people. Guess what? The pastor wasn't sent to the church to mow the grass and to clean the church. The pastor was sent to the church to pray for you and to preach the word. The body of Christ has hands, feet, ears, eyes, and noses. You are the hands, feet, eyes, and noses. The pastor's not the whole body. And this is saying, Pastor, I'm getting out of work. Don't get me wrong. I'll work right beside anybody. I think you know me. For any length of time, you know me it's back by now. All I'm just saying is, I'm sharing the load. I'm sharing, I'm sharing the load. I'm not greedy. 